very special edition of Niantic Office Hours. Um, I am your host, my name is Kit. I look after HR and operations for Niantic in EMEA. And we have an incredible lineup today to talk you through different journeys into the game industry. So I'm gonna hand it over to our speakers in just Hello PAX Online and welcome to this very special edition of Niantic Offers Hours. Um, I am your host, my name is Kit, I look after HR and operations for Niantic in EMEA and we have an incredible lineup today to talk you through different journeys into the game industry. So I'm going to hand it over to our speakers in just a second to introduce themselves. But to just set the stage, today we're going to be hopefully persuading you of all the different routes you can take to move into games. I think once you're participating as a consumer and you're super excited about it, but you don't necessarily have an obvious way in, games can seem like a bit of a black box. So what I hope you leave today with is a great sense of how our three different panelists have taken really different routes in and learn a bit about all the different options available to you. So today we're gonna to be chatting to Trinidad, our head of DNI globally, Laura, our senior game designer working on Pokemon Go, and Daphne, our technical lead manager on Pokemon Go. We've brought the big guns. So um, I'm gonna start handing it over to all of you to tell the audience a little bit more about yourself. Trinidad, do you wanna kick us off? Tell us about your role, where you started as well. Hi everybody, um, I am the head of diversity and inclusion at Niantic. And it started way back when in uh, big data tech. And uh, I have a passion for people. I have a passion for empowering people with information to help them change and, and empower them with the tools that they need to move not only our business forward, but also making sure that it's an equitable, pla equitable place for all people. And honestly, this has been one of the best careers past that I could have ever taken. And I didn't get to the game industry by the conventional way, which was like going to school or, or just having parents in the industry or knowing people. I knew nobody. And honestly, I didn't even know what Niantic was when I started. I mean, not when I started, but when I interviewed, I was like, Niantic, Niantic, it sounds familiar. And when I Googled it, I was like, Pokemon Go? Oh, yes yes let me go for it you know and i didn't know anybody in the company i did the conventional route of applying online through um, the regular sources that we use to uh, search for for jobs so i'm here i'm not going anywhere i'm addicted now i love the game industry i love the people how eccentric we are sometimes and how demanding we are but then also how creative we are and how much we we are just passionate about uh creating games that can impact people so i'm here thank you laura yeah so i probably have a a bit of a winding path into the games industry it, it really started for me when i was a kid playing video games with my brother growing up like that that passion for games was always there and a part of my life, but I actually thought I was going to grow up to be a 3D animator. Uh, so I went to school to study art. So I have a traditional art degree as well as a certificate in 3D animation. Um, while I was going through that journey, uh, the university, I was at University of Utah, started a graduate program where they were going to um, focus on video games. And they're like, hey, you're doing this awesome art stuff and we know you love video games. 
will you come be a part of the first uh, cohort for this graduate program? And I was like, sounds great. I don't 100% know what I'm doing with my life because I'm a kid in college, <laughs> so I would love to. Uh, so I ended up going to the grad program and I got really lucky that the program teaches game design uh, to all the students in that particular program. So I went through the program and I still at that point thought I was gonna be a 3D animator. My first job in the games industry was actually as an intern uh, in animation for Disney at their video game studios. Uh, but then while I was there, uh, they came over and reached out to me because they knew I was really passionate about video games and that um, I was a woman working in the industry. And they asked if I could take a look at some of the mini games they were trying to make that were going to be a bit more female focused uh, for Disney Infinity. And uh, the first game design meeting I went to, I was like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. I've spent seven plus years studying <laughs> to be an animator and in a single meeting I realized that I need to make a pretty big career change uh, so over the course of that um, and a couple of really awesome opportunities and support from friends in the industry I was able to switch to becoming a game designer instead uh, and then eventually that led me to my current role where I am a senior game designer here at Niantic working on Pokemon Go. Daphne you want to share your awesome story? Yeah, um, similar to you, Laura, I also grew up playing games with my brothers and like, I, it's so funny because I never considered myself a gamer. I always considered them gamers, but not me, even though I played alongside them all the time. Um, and so it took me a long time to like embrace that as like a part of my identity. Um, now no one can tell me nothing. I'm definitely a gamer, <laughs> but back then I did not feel this way. Um, but yeah, my my route into games was actually probably more like the most like traditional CS, right? Um, in the sense that I got a bachelor's degree in computer science and then I got a master's in computer science. Um, and I actually got into games a little later in my career. Uh, indirectly through doing like more framework C kind of work. And so, um, you know, multiple positions that I had before Niantic, I was actually like writing code that supported developers who built games as opposed to being the person who was building the games. Um, and that's what ended up leading me here. And so, you know, prior to this job, I was actually working at Apple. And so I was working on what's called the foundation framework. It's Basically, for anybody who's uh, worked in Xcode, when you open up a new Xcode project and you see import foundation, that was my team. Um, and so like millions of developers were using my code every day. Um, and then prior to that, I was working at a startup that was um, building an SDK that at the time was like revolutionary, but you know, now is kind of laughable. But they were essentially just trying to get, um, they got Objective-C to run natively on Android phones. And so like, our prime customers at that point were like game developers. And so we were still, we were in the industry, but tangential. And so Niantic was a really interesting move for me because it was um, a very intentional choice to be like, I wanna be at, I wanna be at the front of it this time. I wanna be at a, at a different part of the stack. I wanna actually be like making stuff that people can actually see and interact with and play with um, and not necessarily be like, the Wally behind scenes, which is what I used to call myself. Um, and so it's been really awesome working on Pigo and uh, being able to just like, you know, make so many players happy. Like that's just, it's really awesome. Awesome, thank you. I think one really interesting common thread for, for all of you is that you'd interacted as players, like however you kind of define yourselves in terms of gamers, casual, hardcore, whatever, you all had that relationship with games, but none of you went straight in. And I'm curious as to, before you were a part of this industry, how much of a sense of it did you have? I.e., what were your, what was kind of your knowledge around the roles available to you? What it was like as a, as a culture? Daphne, what was your kind of, um, what did you anticipate before you were actually a part of the industry? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I was nervous. Just, you know, games is an interesting, like, subset of tech because it's, like, partially a subset, but also partially kind of its own thing, right? It's, it's, um, it's weird. They form almost this little Venn diagram, right? And so, um, 
you know, I mean, I'll be blunt. Like the the media around being a woman in games and being a black and queer woman in games is not great. It's just not. And so like, um, you know, it's it's a little nerve wracking to to step into this and and feel like you're putting yourself out on the chopping block every day. Um, but you know, it it ends up being completely worthwhile. At least it has been for me. And like through this experience, I wouldn't have met any of you and y'all are absolutely lovely. So like, there are so many wonderful people in the industry that, I mean, I've dealt, uh, we can, that's a whole other panel. I've, I've dealt with my share of difficult developers in my lifetime, <laughs> trust. But like, it's been really awesome, particularly at Niantic to be able to work with people who are not only so incredibly smart, but also super sweet. And I just, I, I haven't, had to I almost feel like I've been shielded from just a lot of the uh, craziness that we see out in the media all the time so yeah that was kind of my impression going in well I'm glad that Niantic has defied your expectations of course um Trinidad what about you your role isn't such an obvious like you're not a game designer or a developer but you're really integral to how Niantic functions um and how we all kind of work towards this more inclusive and more kind of representative future. Um, tell us a bit about your understanding of the industry before you were a part of it. Um, just to piggy off, piggyback off of what Daphne said, I mean, the game industry definitely has a bad rep. Like, and I don't know if it's a bad rep. I think for a long time, it was, it is what it was. And um, I, I hear stories, horror stories about like, booth babes in the back back in the day and and just like at conferences and different things like that and I'm just like ooh okay so coming in I know uh, Niantic is one of those companies that's a, a hybrid because it we have a platform and then we also create games so it was a mixture of tech and gaming and it wasn't your traditional studio uh, so coming in, I wanted to defy everything that Daphne said, you know, I don't, I don't want our people to have that negative experience of, of coming to Niantic and saying, oh, it's just like everywhere else. I want people to come to Niantic and, and say, oh, this is a breath of fresh air. Like it's, yes, we still have crunch times. Yes, we still have uh, a high, we are asking for a lot of work we want you to produce that's that's just normal but at the same time we have a community we're a family we trust each other we value each other we respect each other and that's why we're able to um build such a great team of people who who love and and really go above and beyond for our games oh i feel a little like warm and fuzzy now um, Laura, um, how about you? What was your kind of understanding of the different roles, the culture, the industry? Sure. So when I uh, was growing up, which was several moons ago, we won't say how long ago, um, games were an amazing thing. I was a huge gamer. It was definitely like my defining hobby. But at that point in time, there weren't things like dev blogs. There weren't amazing conferences like PAX where you could see developers and game makers talk. So it was sort of this like void right i knew video games existed and i loved them and i played them but i had no real concept of where they came from other than i assume somebody somewhere was probably making them uh you know and it really honestly wasn't until i got to grad school and we started looking at all the options of the games industry and all the different roles from art to tech to you know game design like i do to all the support roles which it's pretty expansive um it wasn't until we started having those conversations that i was like oh wait this might be a viable career path. This, this might be a real industry to look into. Um, and my parents have thankfully always been super supportive, but I know when I was like, I'm gonna work in games, they were like, oh, uh, okay, is that a, is that a job? Is that, do they pay you to do that right? So um, thankfully, uh, they are now reassured that it is a viable career path. But you know, it, it just was so unknown at the time, which is part of why I think doing panels like this is really great, because I want everyone to know that there are paths into the games industry that this is a real job that they pay us to do this awesome work and that like um you know as Trindan and Daphne touched on like for a long time the industry has been pretty small and pretty close to who was going to be a part of it and I think it's been really great to work with women 
and people of different backgrounds and diversity in the industry. Because I think the more voices in the industry, the better the industry is becoming. Uh, so I think doing panels like this and seeing other panels and talking to other people in the industry is so important to just see how the industry is growing and then what steps we need to take to keep it growing from here. I have something to add to what Laura said. You mentioned something about the different roles and types. And I want to remind everybody who's watching that you can be in HR, you can be in marketing, you can be in legal, you can, you can be in facilities, you could be in finance, you can be in ops. Like I just, just some of the different pathways. It's like, it's like any other company, you need a function and you need to be able to have all the different functions to move forward. And, and so don't limit yourself. If you are passionate about game design, yes. If you're passionate about software engineering, yes. But also know that if you not, if you don't know what your niche is yet, that this is your opportunity. I would also add to, um, cause uh, Trinidad, you touched on, on like crunch time. And I think it's, particularly important to highlight that like um, one thing I find really interesting about Niantic and and Pokemon Go in particular having worked and led the team like uh, at a management level we have several managers so many who have are like vets in the industry of you know with ranging years of experience who have dealt with such like horrific crunch <laughs> experiences at past game companies that like in some ways they it's like they brought their their trauma with them and but like in the sense that they never want to relive that again and they never want to put their employees or the org through that again and so like it's it's interesting I, I wanted to highlight that particular point because I feel like um, crunch is considered a norm in the industry in a lot of ways. And it's been really interesting to see how like so many Niantics have like fought back against this. <laughs> like they're just so adamant about it not being a thing here. Um, and anytime there's even a hint towards it, people start to get a little antsy and they're like, uh, 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 no, we don't like this. We don't like this at all, you know, um, which is, highly unusual when you consider just like the reputation of a lot of other companies. 100%. Um, and I think it's also a testament definitely to you two who are actually involved in Pokemon Go as well of the culture that you've both created. So a little bit of props there. Um, so the, the other thing that I'm mindful of for people who are watching this, particularly if they're, they're not in the industry already, sometimes it is hard to know what leap you wanna make and of course how to make that leap but i think that process of identifying like what is the thing that truly energizes you what do you really want to get up in the morning and do um is hard and each of you have done it so um i would love to hear um maybe starting with you laura because you had your light bulb moment in that meeting which i'm so jealous of i wish that my career came to me that easily um i would love to know a little bit about how you thought about what is the thing I really want to do and how you then pivoted that into working into games. Sure. So yeah, like, like I said earlier, I did, I was in that meeting and um, I don't, the meeting could have been going for five minutes before I was like, Oh, this is, this is the thing I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and you know, I, I did have to take some time to reflect because I had spent so long training to become a professional 3d animator that this, the sudden decision to depart from that career path that I've worked so hard on, uh, was a pretty big one, but I, I can be fairly stubborn. So once I, I realized game design was where my true passion was going to be, I made the commitment that I was going to start working towards that goal. Thankfully, at the internship I was at, they they were supportive of that, and they helped me start working on game design while I was there. Uh, and then I started keeping an eye on all possible roles that might be coming up at the industry that was in the area I was in at the time, which was Salt Lake. Um, and I got very fortunate that uh, EA opened up a three-month contract role, uh, and honestly, like, one of the biggest things I can say for anyone who's looking to get into the industry and thinks this might be their path is start reaching out to folks in the industry, like, whether it's connecting with folks on social media or on professional social media sites, like, uh, so what happened is this role opened up at EA, and a friend had applied for it, and they actually moved him to a different role at the company and reopened the three-month contract, uh, and then 
when it reopened, I applied and they looked at my resume and they're like, well, <laughs> she's an animator. Why, why would we talk to her? And it was because my buddy Josh was actually like, trust me, she has an incredible potential to be an amazing game designer. Just bring her in, bring her in, have her do the game design test. And you'll see, like, I know her resume doesn't match up, but just, just take the half an hour to talk to her. I promise she will show you what she has. And had Josh not been willing to, you know, speak up for me and vouch for me when my resume didn't necessarily 100% align for what they were looking at, I never would have gotten the opportunity to get into the game design field. You know, so having that connection, having that friend in the industry really made all the difference in that moment. So networking is invaluable when it comes to the game industry. A lot of it is about who you know. And if you're new and trying to get into the industry and you're nervous about reaching out, this has got to be the most <laughs> relaxed, chill group of people in any industry I've ever met. Folks are almost always happy to chat with people who are trying to get into the industry, students, people who are interested in making a big career shift, because we've all been there, right? We've all needed help from somebody else in the industry. We all needed one, just one person to accept <laughs> when you reach out. So don't, don't be scared to reach out to folks in the industry and start getting to know them. I am definitely going to pick up that thread a little later with everyone else about um, networking, the role that's played. I think sometimes it's viewed as this thing of like, oh, you just know this person and then they get you this job. And actually, it's the culmination of doing loads of hard work. So the thing that matters to you and the thing that feels um, good in terms of just your integrity is also the thing that turns into you getting a job through having good relationships. It's not just like my mate who works for EA. Yeah, okay, I think that's a good point with what I was saying where uh, my friend got me the interview. Had I shown up and not been prepared, uh, they would have been like, nope, we were right. This isn't a good fit for you. But I studied so much between the time he told me of the opportunity and going in. Like I read every possible game design book I could get my hands on and, and just did a ton of research. So making sure you're prepared for when those, op those opportunities arise is super key. Right, you worked for it and you earned it and you happen to have that connection through doing that work and everything else. Okay, cool. Um, Trinidad, let's talk about you because you obviously prior to working in DNI, you were a program manager. And um, I think it's super interesting that you did, you pivoted into your passion and um, you did that in game. So tell us a bit about how you went through that process of reflection and how you kind of consciously moved yourself into the role you wanted. So uh, I worked in DNI prior to being a product manager. So um, when we got acquired, like I worked for EMC, and then when we got acquired by Dell, I kind of saw the writing on the wall, and I was like, "Ooh, I should probably get a job somewhere where they can't fire me." And <laughs> and so I, too, Laura, networked and had friends in high and low places, and uh, they some of them were managers and they're like, Hey, we have this product manager role. We know that this is not your, I was a program manager at the time in DNI, and they're like, we think that you can do it. Are you willing to take the challenge? And so that meant me moving cross country. So I moved from Boston to Santa Clara, California, and I worked on our data protection. Um, I worked on hardware and software and it was our bread and butter and I loved it in the beginning until I realized I was like, I'm not really passionate about data protection. I'm, I mean, I know we need it, but I mean, I'm not changing the world. And at that time I was like the lead of every ERG you can imagine in Santa Clara. I mean, I had, I had a team and we were like, we had like a, a you know, and like a leadership team, but like I was like black, black ERG, Asian ERG, LGBT, like every ERG I, I was the lead on because they all knew that I was coming from the DNI space and they're like, oh my God, oh my God, so great you're here. Yes, help us. And so it was fun. Um, but I just found that I was still doing, that was my passion. Like I would do my work and then I would focus on developing the people around me. And uh, so I had a moment where I was like, when was the last time I was genuinely happy with my work? Because at that time, work for me was, it was almost like I'd get it done quickly just so that I could um, focus on what I love. And so I think at this time, I took time to really reflect, and I was like, when was the last time? And I was talking to my mom, and she was like, when you were doing D&I, you don't remember? You were just like, you were up all hours of the night, and you didn't care. And, and I was like, wow, like, you're right. 
so from that moment on, I, I only applied to DNI roles. Like I made a very specific decision to not apply. And I was getting hit up for product everywhere, like Google, thank you, you know, Facebook, because they need product managers and also they need women of color in product management, you know? And so uh, it was like a shoe in, but at the same time, I felt like that was a distraction because yes, I love Google. Yes, I love these big companies, but I, I'm passionate about diversity and inclusion. And if you're not going to accept me in that role, then I can't help you. And so long story short, I literally just applied to DNI roles and that's how I arrived at Niantic. Okay, awesome. We are going to um, talk a little bit more um, in a couple of minutes about exactly how Trinidad got her job at Niantic, uh, which is a great story, one of my favorites. Uh, but we, but before we do that, Daphne, tell us how did you go? You went from working in Apple to working in Niantic. How did you kind of consciously reflect on what you wanted out of that transition and make it a reality for yourself? Yeah, that's a great question. I am. Um, I had up until just before working at Niantic, I had spent my whole career, you know, working in what, working lower in the stack, and so I was always, you know, building the stuff that devs needed to do the work that they did that users actually interacted with, um, which was great because it just like was a very interesting vantage point. I got to see up into what like developers needed higher up in the stack, but I also was low enough to see into like the stacks, the part of the stacks below me. So like, you know, into the actual OS or like I worked with drivers at some point, like I was, I was doing, um, you know, I, I, the work that I did kind of ran the gamut. And so like, as much as I loved my work at Apple, and and really did feel like the contributions I was making were real contributions. I had a hard time, I found a frustration with having a hard time explaining to people like what exactly I did. And like, you know, I would be like, oh, I worked on foundation. And people are like, oh, okay, that's cool. And I'm like, no, no, you don't, you don't understand. <laughs> Like, I'm like, the reason why you have a rainbow flag emoji is because I wrote that code. <laughs> like, the reason why you have, like, a female professional, like, surfer who can be Black is because I wrote the logic for that. Like, that's, that, that's what I need. And they're like, oh, wow. And I'm like, yeah. So when I say I worked on foundation, it's not, you know, <laughs> but it's like, I, I loved being able to, to um, you know, work at that level and be able to to support devs at that level but i wanted to switch into a role that was a lot more user facing where my work was a lot more obvious and it's like i could point to this thing and be like yeah here this it is in the game you can see it very clearly <laughs> and so um i was really excited about that transition but i would add really quickly to like um since we were talking about like career switches and kind of that like moment when you realize um I so I had mentioned earlier that I took a more like traditional CS route into games but what I did not mention is I took a very like weird route into CS which was like I actually went to school went to my undergrad in New York thinking that I was going to study fashion journalism and so like that was that was where I was, <laughs> I was 18, I moved to New York City, I went to Barnard, and I was like, I'm gonna work for Vogue, and this is gonna be my life, and like, it did not work out that way, but um, it was just kind of funny, because it feels like CS found me in a lot of ways, and so, um, you know, like, Tr Trinidad was talking about just kind of like, you should, you had that anecdote of, you know, being willing to put so many hours into DNI and like, I, I kind of knew how much I loved programming when I took like a solo trip to Germany once but had CS homework and ended up spending, I was only there for 24 hours and I literally spent the whole day at a Starbucks working on building like a network, <laughs> like a, a local client and server and I just like had so much fun just like with my headphones on. I was like, I'm in Munich, like what am I doing? But it was just like the best time ever. So I, it, 
when we talk about like making these career switches, um, I think oftentimes people get tripped up on this idea of like, find your passion. Cause like, it just feels like this very overwhelming thing to do. But I, what I've, you know, turned that into for myself is just like, find your joy, like find where you have fun, find those moments that interest you the most where you're just like, dang, I could do this all day. Or like, even if it's not all day, it's like, I could, I would prefer to do this over doing this other thing. And like, pay attention to when you have those clues, you know? Sorry, struggling to unmute myself there. You know what's crazy? I also started in fashion journalism. So the main takeaway is that if you wanna work for Niantic, be a fashion journalist for a short amount of time and then just scoot right over and we will welcome you. Um, but let's talk about actual strategy. So um, I think this is the part that, and actually I was having a conversation with a friend the other day who's looking to kind of pivot a little bit in terms of her industry. And the big thing is like, how do I express all of this experience that I have, which I can see how there is a relationship there with the role I want. And I have obviously these interests in the role I want, but I look at the job description and I'm not like an obvious fit for it but I think I'd be great. Um, how would you approach that, Daphne? Or how did you approach that? Um, obviously, like there are kind of obvious parallels for you and your role, but I think it'd be great for the audience to hear some tips on that um, kind of application process and the tailoring of all of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll be really blunt. Like when I came to Niantic and expressed interest in a game dev role, I had never worked on Unity, like not at least definitely not in a production sense um the little bit that I'd, i had done on unity prior was just like game jams on my own time it wasn't and it wasn't even super extensive um and so like you know the the team had to know what they were getting <laughs> and bringing me on board um because we're definitely a unity shop um and it was really nerve-wracking at first it it was hard to you know it was hard for me to justify even to myself that I deserved it because of that. And I feel like that's really where it starts. Um, I was really lucky because like, and I know you mentioned, we'll talk about networking later, but like I had known somebody who was at Niantic already and like they were able to put in a good word for me. But like on top of that, I think there also comes a point in your career where your resume just kind of starts to speak for itself in the sense that like, you know, and, and I think Niantic is really good about this, but other companies do this as well, where it's just like, you know, maybe you don't have the exact qualities that they're looking for in the list, but they trust that you're capable of doing the work because you have a history of doing great work elsewhere. And so like, Niantic was able to, to, to look at my history of doing great work elsewhere and be like, okay, you don't know this one tool, but you're a programmer, you can pick it up. That's what programmers do, they learn new tools. So like, we have full faith in your ability to learn new tools. And I was really appreciative of that. I remember like, um, you know, when I first, first started at Niantic, like we had a internal hackathon and I wanted to do it because it was a good opportunity for me to like do a bit of a crash course in Unity. And I remember like, I, you know, it was using this like parts of our platform that were, you know, really awesome, but also very new. Um, and I was experimenting, but a lot of it was also me just like learning how to like set up a Unity project and start from the basics. And so after the hackathon, you know, they wanted us to like present these projects to the whole company. And <laughs> like my, it just was very easy and for me to see very early on that like the quality of what I produced was like so much lower than like what everybody else had cranked out. And I was also a one man team versus like these other teams that were like three or four people or they were working on something pre-existing. And I, I remember right before that, you know, it was a all hands meeting. I was on the phone with my parents 20 minutes beforehand in the lobby of the ferry building sobbing because I was like, my coworkers are going to think I'm stupid. They're going to think I don't deserve this job. Like, 
I, I, they're going to want to fire me. Like I, my project looks so dumb. <laughs> and my parents were like, no, like you just have to like, just, just present it and you're going to be fine. And I was like, everyone is going to think I'm so stupid. <laughs> and so I, I remember like, you know, I put a smile on my face and I presented the hell out of that thing. And I was just like, okay, I'm just going to stand by it. And I actually got so much wonderful, like, it was just a great reception. And actually, Laura reached out to me and was like, hey, your idea sounds really cool. If you ever want to flesh it out more, like, come talk to me. I can, like, give you some game design tips. And I was like, this is amazing. So anyway, long story short, like, you don't necessarily have to have the exact skills to be good at the job. <laughs> I actually really quick want to, um, you know, having been on the other side of Daphne's story, everyone was blown away by what she was presenting. Everyone was so impressed and thought it was so awesome. I think that's actually a really good lesson for this industry is um, imposter syndrome is real. It's, it's a real thing. A lot of folks, uh, regardless of the role or the level at which they're in their role, especially when you're starting a new job, feeling like, did I trick them into hiring me? Why am I here? I don't know what I'm doing. Like everyone was blown away by what Daphne had done. So knowing that that was so scary and you were so worried about it, it's so crazy because on the other side, we we're like, Daphne knows what she's doing. She's amazing, right? So like, just know that those, those moments of insecurity and fear, they're real, but like just push through them. And yeah, no one, no one else would have ever guessed Daphne that you were nervous. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's a really good lesson that like, just keep pushing forward. And like one way or another, as long as you're doing your best, it will probably work out. Oh, um, it makes my heart break a tiny bit, but I also love that lesson. And I try and look out for people that I have worked with who have just backed themselves and they've kind of got what they asked for. And it was almost as simple as that. And I'm like, if I do that, but I also work really hard and just deliver great work, like it, it does kind of come together. Um, Trinidad, I think the time, just a little bit conscious of time, and I want to talk about networking, but I also really want to talk about your story of kind of how you got into Niantic. I also think it's really important to note that you did apply, right? And so talk us through, like, what was your strategy um, and how did you demonstrate fit with the role? I can make it short and sweet. Like, I applied on a website and I got a call back and my first conversation was with one of our recruiters her name is An um, Angie and is her name Angie do you mean Angela sorry yeah I'm <laughs> I Angela. Angela. she is one of my favorite humans Talk why did I say Angie though anyways it's it's I'm not a morning person anyways long story short I was just talking to her late last night actually uh, Angela is amazing and in our first conversation she was like wow I can hear your passion, like you, you light up, like, because she asked me, you know, how have my interviews been? And I was like, yeah, I just had a product manager interview. And I think my tone was like, you know, pretty low. She's like, when you start talking about DNI, you just lit up like, like a light bulb. And um, so just talking to her, going through the process, I met some of the wonderful people that work at Niantic on my panel. And, um, I was surprised when I got to the end where I had to meet with the CEO and that was where I needed all this preparation. You know, I needed to have a PowerPoint and show my six month plan. And I, I mean, I literally prayed over it. I went to every single person that I love and know that I respect and said, Hey, can you take a look at this? Can I present it to you? Can I show you? I practiced and, um, and even my mentors, I sent them a rough draft. I was like, hey, can y'all see this? And, and my, my, uh, my ex, one of my ex-bosses was like, this is way too long. She's like, you need to cut this down to five slides. <laughs> I was like, what? And that was, I mean, honestly, that was good advice, like understanding our, like how we are at Niantic. So, you know, cut it down. And uh, so my diagram, which was, you know, lovely, which was like, you know, diversity, inclusion, equity, and then, you know, Niantic circle, and there's a heart in the middle, which is, you know, pointing to it, you know, like all of our different, I took the mission and I, you know, put it in like a, a diagram and then I put a heart and that was diversity, equity, inclusion. I said, this should be the heart of Niantic. And in my one-on-one um, -on -one with John, I said, and honestly, if you're not ready to do the work, don't hire me. Uh, if you are not interested in actually seeing systemic 
blocker is broken and changed, then you, I'm not the person person for you. And that was one of the best things I ever said and did because, you know, we talk about imposter syndrome and yeah, that tries to sneak in, but I was authentically myself from day one and I have been able to continue to be that because of being authentically myself during all of the interviews and, 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 you know, not, not code switching, which is so easy to do when you're used to doing it, especially in corporate America. Um, so yeah. And, and I will say this, like to, to forward and to go move forward into networking, like doing my research of going on Twitter and, and befriending people, going on LinkedIn, befriending people, going on Facebook, like, and asking questions from people who are, were in my network on what I should do, because I've never been in this industry before. That's what held me up. Like they lifted me as I was trying to climb. And I can't tell you how invaluable, invaluable, or how valuable, no, valuable, sorry, how valuable it is to network even now like now in my position as D dni uh, i have external partnerships and i've been able to have like i have a village in the game industry there's so many people that i like i went to gdc i met so many people that i'm like oh my gosh yeah we're gonna be friends forever you know and then going to to pax going to these consumers E3 and, and just the energy, the people are excited. And when you find people who are become, they become your village, you don't want to get rid of them. And like I said, I'm addicted. I'm not going anywhere. Like, you know, if Niantic fires me, I'm going to find another game industry job. <laughs> like I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Niantic has no plans to fire Trinidad. <laughs> Clear that one up to my knowledge. Um, so Laura, let's talk about networking with you then, because you mentioned it right at the beginning. And imagine like if someone is wanting to get into game design now, where should they go? Who should they be talking to? Like what events should be, they be showing up at? Yeah, I would definitely encourage anyone who, who is interested in game design to look at a couple of options. There's the more traditional route, which I went, which was going to an academic program. Uh, but that's not the best fit for everyone. I think another really valid route is to be learning and studying and building game design or building games uh, on your own as well. That's also super valid. I think the, the key piece between those two is starting to reach out to folks, whether I think Trinidad mentioned a few things, whether it's on Twitter or LinkedIn or going to local game jams or going to local um, meetups for the games industry. There's a lot of different groups in the games industry to get together often once a month. And we're all doing it digitally right now, obviously, but eventually we'll return to doing it in person. Uh, going to conferences and uh, attending conferences related to the games industry is another great way. Just any place you think there might be folks who make games, it, start looking for those opportunities and start attending. And like I was mentioning earlier, if you're intimidated to approach somebody at one of those events, don't be. We're all, at the end of the day, mostly just a big group of nerds who love video games, right? We're just really passionate about what we do, but it's a lot of people who are just very thoughtful and kind and are excited to talk to people who are excited. And I can say for those of you who might be in the industry already, like whether you're mid to senior level, the best thing you can do is mentor somebody. So if somebody reach out and they're looking for advice, there is nothing more reinvigorating for your career than talking to somebody who's brand new or is trying to break into the industry. You know, if you're having a rough time, if you've been working really long on a project, mentoring somebody who's brand new and has fresh eyes and is just so excited to take on the industry, it just makes everything so much better. So honestly, like the senior folks in the industry who are mentoring or who are helping people who reach out are getting just as much back in trade. So please, that's my biggest thing is just, just reach out reach out and try to connect with a few folks and the industry's busy so don't be upset if it takes folks a while to get back to you but it's okay to reach out again after a couple of weeks and be like hey i'm just checking in again seeing if you had a chance to get back thanks you know like follow-up is really important in this industry too awesome okay and our final few minutes daphne from an engineering point of view where should people be going whether it's for networking or finding job opportunities in the industry um, honestly, I don't have that much more to add on top of what Laura said. Like, I, I think everything that you would do if you were interested in, in trying to learn more about game design, as Laura put it, like, you would do the same for engineering. You would, like, build your own games. If that's the route that you want to take, you 
would read whatever books you can if that is what works better for you. Um, as Laura put it, lots of meetups, lots of game jams. Like there's there are plenty of, of opportunities to go out and and meet people and just reach out to them. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Laura put it so well, so I feel like I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't add. <laughs> Okay, cool. Well, Trinidad, keep me honest on this, but I think we're pretty much at time. We are. Okay. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining and thank you to our wonderful panelists. It's been, I say it's been lovely to catch up with you. I catch up with you anyway, but it's been especially lovely to catch up with you and hear from you right now. Um, if you are interested in getting into games, um, do check out our career site. I believe it is careers.nianticlabs.com. Um, where you can see all of our openings across all of our locations globally. Um, and you are perfectly welcome to reach out to any of us as well, if you want any kind of tips or advice. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, because I am um, really boring and not very much on Twitter. Uh, my name is Kit Gilbert. Uh, let's go through the group as well and, and tell people where they can find you. Trinidad, where should people follow you or reach out to you? Um, I am on LinkedIn as well, first name, last name, Trinidad Hermina, but I'm also on Twitter uh, at this is Trini and on Discord at this is Trini Twitch. You could find me at this is Trini pretty much anywhere. Uh, and this is Trini is just this is T R I N I. Awesome. Laura, how about you? I am also on LinkedIn. Uh, full name is Laura Warner. So if you just search for that, it should bring up my profile. Uh, and then you can also find me on Twitter. I am at uh, Laura WQF. So that's L A U R A W Q F. Cool. And Daphne. Um, also on LinkedIn, Daphne LaRose. Um, and I um, actually don't use Twitter because I just find Twitter so incredibly overwhelming. But um, I'm definitely on Instagram. So you can find me at Life is Sweet Good. I use that handle for everything. That's very inspiring. I wish I had slightly more imaginative handles now. Um, well, thank you so much, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed um, this panel. And that is it from us. Thank you. Bye.